So, uh, what is load, water load adapt? Uh, perhaps you are not familiar with this, uh, this term. Um, probably you better know the term tectonic subsidence, or total tectonic subsidence. I shall speak about tectonic sus subsidence and heat flow in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So uh, this part of the Mediterranean is uh, uh, a very complex area. Uh, it contains uh, patches uh, of uh, uh, very old ocean lithosphere, or at least it seems so, uh, because the extension of these patches and also the age of these patches is uh, really poorly uh, known. Uh, this area is also characterized by a very thick uh, sedimentary cover um, so that the geophysics uh, doesn't work very well in defining the structure and the features of the crust and the lithosphere. Uh, the main uh, structural features of, of this area uh, are the Ionian Basin, uh, the Herodotus Basin and the Levantine Basin. So the nature of the, of the lithosphere in the Ionian perhaps is oceanic. There are some seismic pieces, some uh, pieces of evidence from seismic uh, uh, investigation that uh, point to uh, an oceanic type lithosphere. But the uh, nature of a lithosphere beneath the Erodotus and the Levantine is really poorly unknown. Uh, there are uh, authors that uh, claim that the Levantine was uh, generated by stretching of continental lithosphere, but others um, believe that uh, the Levantine uh, is underlined by oceanic crust and lithosphere, or even a mixture between oceanic and continental. Um, also the ages are uh, rather un uncertain. Uh, another important feature of this area is the uh, large uh, long wavelength uh, gravity anomaly, uh, which is probably related to uh, some deep geodynamic processes, processes that occur in the mantle. Okay, uh, uh, this is, these are the ages of the basins, uh, Ionian, uh, Rhodotus and Levantine as inferred from several pieces of geological and uh, um, geophysical evidence. Re uh, the ages range from uh, 100 million years for the Levantine to more than 300, 350 million years for the Herodotus. Another important feature uh, of the area is the lithosphere thickness. Uh, perhaps it, this thick lithosphere is one of the most Oh, we have also music. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. okay. So this <laughs> this thick lithosphere is perhaps one of the most enigmatic structures in, in, in the area, uh, and uh, it is not only related to the occurrence of a slab which was recognized here in, in the Aegean Sea by means of uh, uh, tomographic uh, studies and probably is related to some uh, deep uh, process uh, that occurs in the mantle. So uh, in the study we uh, started from calculation of the tonic subsidence and analysis of heat flow and we try to investigate the nature of the Eastern Mediterranean lithosphere. Uh, so we used bathymetry data and heat flow data. We corrected uh, both uh, for calculating uh, the uh, tectonic subsidence and for calculating the corrected heat flow. And uh, then we compare tectonic subsidence and heat flow with uh, uh, the prediction of some reference models uh, for uh, continental stretching and ocean lithosphere. Uh, the mm, final goal was to discriminate between uh, continental and oceanic areas. So first uh, we have a look to the heat flow. This is the, the map of the observed heat flow in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, data are, are 
uh, derived from the global heat flow database. And uh, okay, we have uh, quite a number of uh, classical marine heat flow measurements, uh, but there are also boreholes, uh, ocean drilling program, and the SDP, this sea drilling program boreholes. There are some, not many, uh, bottom hole temperatures and also measurements here in the island of Cyprus uh, from an old paper by Morgan, 1979. Uh, the observed heat flow is quite low. Uh, it ranges from 8 to 84 milliwatt per meter square, but in general it's quite low. So we uh, carefully check the heat flow uh, um, in the original papers uh, and we try to assess the quality of this uh, database. And uh, uh, we found that there were many, unfortunately many, heat flow values that were of very poor quality. This is just an example. Uh, this picture showed two boreholes, two ODP boreholes. Uh, the value that you see, the heat flow value that you see in the insert in the left corner, 15 milliwatt per meter square and 8 milliwatt per meter square is the heat flow value which is reported in the heat flow database. So we uh, extract the original data from the paper and we notice that uh, the heat flow and the gradient, in, uh, above all in the uppermost part, in the shallower part of these portals, is extremely low. You see 0 0.9 millikelvin per meter or 1.1 milliwatt per meter square, or even negatives. If this, of course, affects the final value of heat flow that was calculated by means of the Baller method. So we think that this kind of data uh, are, mm, are not uh, reliable. Probably there are some local effects, fluid flow, or um, I don't know what. But uh, this kind of data were uh, rejected and were not used for the uh, subsequent analysis. So we corrected the heat flow for the two main perturbation effects. Uh, that is uh, the sedimentation. Uh, the average correction is uh, quite small, but uh, it's important. And for paloclimate, depending on the depth, you see we used uh, the maximum depth of the boreholes, 300 meters. Uh, uh, so the correction may vary from four to about six milliwatts per meter square. And okay, this is the final map of the corrected heat flow. Uh, you see here only the heat flow values, the heat flow sites that survived the selection criteria uh, of quality. And uh, you see that there are many blue dots. Blue dots means heat flow values lower than 50 milliwatt per meter square. So quite low heat flows. This morning we saw very high heat flow in the uh, Gulf of California. This area is characterized by very low heat flow. Only four heat flow sites denote values of heat flow larger than 50 milliwatt per meter square. And if we look at the uh, average values of the Ionian Aerodotus and Levantine, we have quite low heat flow as well, around 40 milliwatt per meter square. So, uh, uh, let's go to the tectonic subsidence or simply subsidence. Um, and, and we calculated tectonic subsidence uh, uh, by using bathymetry data and uh, we adjusted bathymetry data for the uh, uh, effect of uh, uh, the sediment load uh, by applying a sediment correction, CS, that depends uh, on density, uh, depends uh, uh, on this, uh, this is the, 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 uh, the uh, formula that uh, allows the, the calculation of the correction. And, uh, okay, uh, um, in, 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 in the critical parameter for calculating the correction uh, are especially the mean bulk density of the sediments and the thickness of the sediments. And the mean bulk density in terms depends on the grain density, porosity of the sediments, uh, the compaction factor, uh, 
uh, and is described by this uh, equation. All these parameters can be extracted from uh, data available from the boreholes. That we have many boreholes in this area, uh, the ODP and the SDP boreholes, which contain this kind of data. So we can use this data uh, from core samples for uh, inferring the grain density, porosity, and finally calculate the bulk density of the, uh, of the sediments. So just to show you the database, this is the database of bathymetry. We use the Edmonet uh, database and uh, this is the crust one model for the sediment thickness. Unfortunately, the crust one model has uh, a quite poor spatial resolution, only one degree by one degree. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we, we could calculate the sediment correction as only for uh, uh, one degree by, and, and finally the, the tectonic subsidence only for one degree by one degree bins. Okay, and this slide you see the estimation of a bulk density versus depth. We have uh, uh, even 10 kilometers of sediment thickness in this basin, so it's very huge sedimentary uh, column, and uh, we uh, had information, direct information from boreholes only for the uppermost 600 meters. So we uh, had to extrapolate uh, the uh, bulk density also to uh, the uh, basement uh, up to, uh, uh, down to 10 kilometers depth. So we used uh, to integrate the direct information uh, on bulk density, also uh, the uh, seismic velocity information and we convert the seismic velocity into, into bulk density and finally we reconstructed the bulk density versus step variation curve for the free basins. You see the red dots are uh, the bulk density values inferred from seismic velocity and the blue dots are the bulk density measured on the core samples extracted from, from the boreholes. Okay, and uh, thanks to this data, we uh, could calculate the correction curves, uh, sediment correction of 4.3, the, uh, the, the, the left part of the slide cannot be seen. Uh, this is the correction, uh, correction, okay, thanks, sediment correction, CS, as a function of the thickness of sediments for the free basins, Ionian, Rhodotus, and Levantine. You see that the curves di are different because uh, the, 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 the sediment column is different in the free basins. And uh, um, okay, and then from the, by uh, combining bathymetry data and sediment correction with, uh, Calculate the tectonic subsidence. This is the map of the tectonic subsidence. And okay, the tectonic subsidence is uh, about six kilometers in the Ionian basin, uh, about 6.5 kilometers in the Herodotus basin, and uh, a little bit less than uh, four kilometers in the Levantine basin. So, next steps. Now we have heat flow, corrected flow and uh, tectonic subsidence data. So what we can do, we, we can compare tectonic subsidence and heat flow with some reference models. Uh, as a first step, we use the little sphere plus stretching model for continental basin, and we compare uh, the subsidence uh, with the prediction of the stretching model why only subsidence? Because if uh, we assume that the age, the minimum age of these basins is 100 million years, we can argue that uh, all these basins have reached a thermal equilibrium so that there is no more signature in the heat flow. So the heat flow is uh, nearly flat. Therefore, uh, in this slide, you see only the uh, comparison of prediction in terms of subsidence of the pure stretching continental lithosphere and the subsidence, the tectonic subsidence we estimated from bathymetry data. 
And what we see is that the Levantine Basin uh, uh, is agree with uh, an age as of uh, about 100 million years and a stretching factor ranging between <coughs> 2 and 3. So this is quite in good agreement with the estimation of the age for this basin and also uh, with a stretching factor estimated by some authors with uh, different <coughs> approaches. Uh, what we see is also that the tectonic subsidence of the Herodotus and the Levantine does not fit the pure statue model. We can argue that these two basins are not of continental nature, but maybe they are oceanic. So, the second step was to compare the data of the Ionian and Herodotus basin in uh, heat flow and substance with reference model for oceanic lithosphere. Uh, okay, we used both the plate model and the half space model. The comparison is not easy because, uh, as Dave Chapman showed before, the data uh, available for classical oceanic lithosphere. Uh, uh, are based on ages uh, of less than 160 million years. So, but our basins are much older or are likely to be much older. Uh, so uh, uh, we have no constraints uh, behind 160 million years, but we can extrapolate the scars and we can compare our uh, values with the prediction of these scars. This is the plate model, and you see that uh, neither uh, the heat flow nor the tectonic subsidence fit the model. And in particular, there is a, a very important subsidence excess in the Rhodotus basin. So about 1.5 kilometers, uh, the basin is 1.5 kilometers deeper than what expected. That's surprising. So. We try with half space. And if we look at the heat flow, the things are much better. But it is important to stress that both the plate model and the half space neglect the heat flow produced by the sediments. In this case, we have to take into account the heat flow produced by the sediments because the sediments are as thick as 10 kilometers. We may calculate the contribution in terms of heat flow uh, given by, produced by the uh, radiogenic heat production of sediments and we may estimate it uh, of uh, about 2 milliwatt per meter square for the Ionian Sea and even 5 milliwatt per meter square in the Erodotus. So we have to decrease, to correct the heat flow uh, to make uh, a more correct comparison. Then after the correction for heat production, the heat flow is decreased. And you see that it, it, better, match, it better matches the, uh, the heat flow versus H curve uh, predicted by the half space model. And if you change a little bit the ages, we shift a little bit left the Ionian Sea to an age of 180 million years and the Herodotus to an age of 290 million years. We have a perfect match. So this may argue that the ages of this basin are a little bit younger than uh, what is reported in commonly reported in the literature. Five minutes. Less. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what about the tectonic subsidence for the hard space? You see that instead there is no agreement uh, with the uh, hard space uh, curve. Uh, the results are therefore puzzling for the hard space. Uh, 
but uh, we must, we, uh, must uh, take into account that, uh, that these reference models that, that assume isostatic equilibrium, and we may have also fracture, fracture of a little sphere, uh, fracture rigidity may, uh, may have effects, uh, and uh, there is some literature about it. Uh, uh, there is a paper by Kirby in uh, 2018 um, that claimed that this may lead uh, to uh, over or uh, underestimate uh, of uh, the, the, the topography. So, uh, in conclusion, we uh, can argue that in the Levantine Basin, we should have a continental lithosphere. Uh, in, and uh, the large tectonic subsidence and low heat flow in the Rhodotus and Ionian Basins argue instead for an oceanic nature of the little sphere. Uh, okay, unfortunately both of the models, uh, the half space and the plate models, uh, seems not satisfactory in accounting for the tectonic uh, subsidence. And uh, this may mean that uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea somehow escapes from classical schemes of oceanic lithosphere cooling and subsidence. Uh, okay, the Ionian are the Ionian and the Rhodotus uh, all the only basin that behave in such a way. No, there is another example in the world. There is the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico uh, is characterized by very low heat flow, and there is something that doesn't work with the uh, plate model or half space model also in the Gulf of Mexico, and probably. Uh, uh, Ionian, Rhodotus, and Gulf of Mexico are uh, rare examples of patches of oceanic lithosphere that uh, has survived subduction and cooled without being reheated uh, by small, can con con small scale convection, which is uh, implied for keeping the heat flow constant after 160 million years. So uh, the excess of subsidence. Uh, uh, is consistent with free air gravity data, where the heat flow data seems in better agreement with the R space model. And okay, what's the reason for that? Maybe that uh, all these features could be uh, explained by the presence of a very cold and thick lithosphere which is sinking uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Mediterranean area and uh, there is some downwelling of the mantle uh, as a result of this negatively buoyant thick lithosphere. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>